And I want to start with a question actually for each of you to react. We have gone through a period now of extraordinary success, I think the industry is unanimous in saying that, in spite of the virus. And what I would like to ask each of you is whether you think it's because of the virus. Michael, do you have a thought on that? No, I don't, I don't think it's because of the virus. I think the virus um, and everyone staying at home and not having sporting games to watch, uh, it certainly accelerated it, but um, we have technology that's um, playing a very big role, uh, and more probably than ever, I think. And uh, I think certainly the virus and then the inflationary period um, uh, that we've, we've been in, all this money rolling around, uh, certainly has played a role. Stephen, what do you, what do you see? Uh, similar to what Michael said, it's the environment that we live in, the environment that the virus created, where people were stuck at home, learning more about watches, educating themselves, uh, more money to spend, no more travel, no more buying higher clothes in the luxury world. So, for a man who enjoys his watches, it became a perfect storm. So, I, I would say that I wouldn't blame the virus, but the environment that was created around the pandemic definitely helped the luxury and specifically the watch business. Uh, I don't think the virus has anything to do with it. I think the economy has to do with it with easy money and uh, people being able to go easily or get money from the government. I think this created a kind of fair inflation and uh, a certain boredom came with the virus and that had people to buy more watches. I think the virus has something to do with it, but maybe in a different way. I think we, we might have seen a switch in what watches we buy on what channel versus the other way around. And it certainly made the crisis that we were expecting, we would see a hit in demand, become a crisis in supply. And I think that's going to be one of the unexpected side effects. But interestingly, the first day when Zurich, the stores reopened, all the luxury stores had queues out there. So I think what the virus accelerated was the feeling of, I deserve that. From the consumer point of view, if you remove the investment problem, I think that was fascinating to me. But what, do we have anything that is a, a taking from Peter to pay Paul, which is a little bit like if everybody remembers what happened to the technology industry over that year 2000 thing, where companies spent massively at the time to upgrade all their computer systems, and everybody in Silicon Valley was saying, you know, happy days are here again. And there was a crash because you had an acceleration of demand for that one event, and that was followed by no spending. Because it, you know, everybody, as they said, had shot their luck. Is there any of that feeling that you see any of you? When you say taking from Eden to pay Paul, when I said I think that in, in, in our environment, in the high, I specialize in high end independent watch making, and so in the ultra luxury. The family would go on vacation, spend fifty to one hundred fifty thousand dollars on a vacation, taking from Peter to pay Paul. So instead of spending on the vacation, they bought a watch. So I believe yes. I, has anybody ever heard of it? I was just going to say that you, you consider it's a two thousand twenty nineteen all over again, and I think um, in twenty nineteen a lot of us felt that things couldn't keep on going so crazy, right? And and obviously they they've gotten as a product even more crazy since. So I think it will be interesting to see when does it start to, to level off your pain. Because that could be tomorrow, it could be 10 years from now. I mean, do, do we have any effects based upon fashion going on? For, for example, I, I'm t I don't want to take away from tomorrow's memo, which is on steel. But one of the things going on, which is fueling a lot of demand, has been steel, unprecedented demand. Does that have a, any relation to any of this, or is that just a separate phenomenon from what we're otherwise seeing? Well, we have been waiting on a consolidation of the market, which didn't happen in the last two years. So, at the beginning of the pandemic, people were saying we're going to be seeing watch brands go out of business, which in effect did not happen. But we're still seeing a consolidation or 
block by and for brands and with less risk. And stainless steel currently is to be seen as the less risky choice because we have so many more people joining the watch waves that have learned, oh my god, I can make money with buying watches, that we no longer just have the past but we can also have investors that don't necessarily know a lot about watches. I want, I want to follow up on that. When you say some people are buying watches because they think it's a great investment, how much of a factor is that in the great growth you have from the abyss, let's say, in the first part of 2020? Do we have a day, an hour, a week? <laughs> I think it's a huge factor. I think it's a problem, and I think that people are buying because of the investment factor that they've seen. And the passionate watch collectors is becoming more difficult. I'm a collector first before I started in the business. And it's not as much fun as what I'm hearing about the collectors telling me because what they want, they can't get. And if they want to buy it, they have to pay over retail, or double retail, or five times retail. And the fun and the passion for a lot of people has moved away. And the people that came in for these steel pieces, we know what the bigger brands are doing. And for them, I think it's the investment play. Something changes that could see a decline. I think it's changed collecting too because um, you know now if the Rolex dealer calls you up and says, you know, here we've got whatever piece that we're thinking of before. Now as a collector, I think you feel much more pressure to say yes, even if you don't love the watch, because you know you can flip it on, uh, if, if you want to, or you know you're not gonna get another call in the next three years. Rolex dealers still more <laughs> like <you> had, <laughs> They're calling me about the green novels. That's the, the call I'm waiting for. But that does raise a question. Waiting lists. And buy this watch in order to buy, or to qualify to buy that watch. How much of that do you think is going to keep going? Waiting list is, uh, waiting is soft. It's often for the retailer, it's often for the maker, and it's often for the person who has name on the waiting list. Uh, I think nobody wants a waiting list. Nobody. Uh, I think the man would like to meet uh, offer, offer would like to meet the man. I don't think Rolex is trained purposely not to make watches. I think they have a plan, and the plan is no more than 5% or X amount of watches a year, and they won't go beyond that because they're a 100 year old company, and they know that going beyond that will mean that maybe they prefer the market at one point. For independent, it's a different problem. The model is, if I produce 150 watches a year and I go and I produce another 50, I have to put so much money in capital uh, in my company that it becomes very capital intensive. And uh, it's not something that a lot of independents are willing to do. Um, you take Jean, I don't think Jean can go from 600 to 1,000 watches that fast and that easily in terms of money. Um, so uh, there's nobody to blame here. It's not like you can pinpoint and say, Oh my God! These guys are trying to flip watches. We have to blame them. They, they're doing what a normal economy is doing. They're buying and getting an opportunity to make money. Um, the, the issue is how long will this dysfunction between offer and demand last? And uh, history shows us that it, it won't last so long. I mean, at one point when you want your lottery, you're going to get your lottery. I mean, so I, I have a question. May, may I blame someone? <laughs> now that I'm on the I do think that retail could handle waiting lists much better than they currently do. And I think from, from a luxury point of view, I think we're all okay with waiting lists. It's a product that's per se exclusive, and that can be explained, but the way waiting lists are currently being handled, that could be improved. And I think it is extremely dangerous for the industry how waiting lists are being handled. First of all, we don't see the real demand. If everyone tries to get on a waiting list with every retailer on earth, this is not reflecting true demand. So how are watch brands are going to plan for future production? The other thing is, and I just had an email this morning from, from a friend of mine saying, I can get a no-date somewhere here if I buy jewelry worth 10,000 Swiss francs on top of that. This cannot be in the interest of retail, this cannot be in the interest of the watch brands, and it can definitely not be in the interest of the end consumer. Well, I want to just challenge you on that, because the retailer just sold some jewelry that maybe he was having a more difficult time <laughs> selling other ones, so he's probably having a great 
great time going to the Cronin Hall. So, do you really think that's something? I think it's 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 dangerous. It's I get it from a business point of view. If I'm a retailer, but how do you? We do know that retail has a long term issue. It, it is one of the industries or one of the segments of the industry that is really struggling, and that probably at some point you're talking about e-commerce. So retail needs to figure out what their role is, and this cannot be a role to blackmail clients and to force them into things that are not there. So okay, can I turn this around and ask you then, what if a brand gives a retailer uh, who wants to open that brand and says, okay, you can take the good sellers, but you also have to take the dogs. I mean, the, the problem doesn't stop at retail. It also no, it, it really is how brands and retail are working together on the list and how they assign products. And I mean, it's, it's a housemate problem. Not having enough supply requires so it really is, it's a combined issue. And, and antitrust lawyer would call that tying, but we all know that's been a feature of the watch industry for decades. If you, for example, are a dealer of a particular brand, they won't let you cherry pick the best pieces if you don't take some of the other pieces that are moving more slowly. I mean, that's been around for a while. All you guys agree with that? Uh, I, yes, absolutely. And I think but I, it hasn't been around at the, maybe the same level that we are now to, you know, you can't even buy a date just, you know, now. Uh, the, 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 the scope of where that applies has grown so much. And I don't think this is going away um, anytime soon. I think it's interest rates may go back up and then people may start spending money on, on those cars and vacations again. But to Williams, the production of this cars. Even even Rolex, let alone Jean, is so constrained, and you just can't simply make that many more watch makers in a short period of time. I, I have a question because you might see this William with your Messina Lab watches. Are you seeing the phrase now is supply chain issues? Are you seeing that in the production of your watches? So we, we made uh, a watch this year called With Me. It's a uh, Malaysian based company with watches of Swiss made. We made two series of 100 watches, actually 50 and 150 watches. The overall series was 200. And I, I, when, when, we, when we started that thing, it was in March of 2020, and we thought 200 was actually maybe a little bit too ambitious. When we launched the watch, we had 13,986 demand for the 200 watches. Uh, and the site crashed twice. Uh, so you end up in a situation where you have 13,987 people that want 200 watches. So how do you deal with this? So the normal human thing to deal with this is, well, people have been supporting you all along to get a watch first. Uh, and uh, that's the way you think. Yeah. Okay, this guy has been buying all my watches, he's a client of mine, I want to sell him a watch. And then you're left with maybe 150 watches. And you're like, what am I doing with those guys? I have, now I have 13,000, 687 people, and I have 130 watches. And you go random, we went random. We literally used a Google generator and we picked a name that we had, the, all the emails that we put on a spreadsheet. But we, we got, you know, 13,500 people insulting us uh, the next day. But I, actually, but my question was slightly different. When you're producing the watches and working with the independent watchmakers who are, are with you, you've got obviously lots of different kinds of suppliers, everything from the movement to the hair springs to the cases. Are you seeing supply issues there that hold up your production? It's a mess. I mean, I, maybe because I'm kind of new and I'm, I'm kind of far away and I'm not, you know, I don't have an office in Geneva or in uh, La Vallée de Joux. But it's a mess. I mean, I, I literally have to buy, uh, I have to beg suppliers to, to sell me things. And I, I do very small quantities, 10, 20 watches. So it's even worse for them because in terms of volume, it's nothing. When you order 20 cases, you're ordering nothing. I mean, just to give you an example, I, as what we did, the, uh, the Lucas Soprana Messina we were ordering 11 uh, cases, and I had uh, two special cases that were being made. And the supplier could not. I uh, will not budge, you will not give me the, the, the cases, and I will text it every day. And finally, when Switzerland beat France this summer in soccer at the European Cup, I called him at 11.30 at night to congratulate him, and he was like, okay, I'll do the cases for you now. And that was it. 
we almost won. But I don't have the solution really not, I think because we have two participants that have production knowledge. I think getting figuring out who is getting these pieces is going to be key. Because and I, I applaud you for doing the neutral thing with random assignments. But the moment your brand ends up two minutes after on, on, on the website with a with a with a margin up there from someone who's just a flipper, that cannot be in your interest. It's part of the game. You know, I, you, you, you cannot beat that. You, you it, it hurts if it's a friend of yours. It doesn't hurt so much when somebody you know. But I have a question. Is this new or is this something that has been around? Nothing to do with what we've just been through over the last two years. It's totally new. It's been around for many, many, many years, but maybe in a scale of 100, maybe there were one or two pieces across brands. Maybe there were one or two or three pieces across entities to speak about Rolex. I mean, we all knew that the Daytona stainless steel was impossible to get for many, many, many years, and they were waiting for us for it. We had to be a customer and we were competing, etc. Today is every single one. Stainless steel watch for the next ladies or men is other reads that are possible to get. So the phenomenon is new, but I think the scale of it is totally beyond what I ever was. Actually, I was I was going at William's comment about getting his 11 cases that it, it, it took Switzerland to beat France in a football match in, in order for that to happen. I remember Kari talking about producing watches that were otherwise completed except for the dial sat in his workshop for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks. He finally bought a dial company. So that has been there. Is it just worse now? Yeah. And, and I think the reason is also because of that integration that you just mentioned. I think a lot of the independents, uh, when they're flush with money by, by the suppliers in order to in order to be able to access that supply, uh, our problem is exacerbated because it's set up on such a large scale. So the supply is so much, the demand is so much greater than supply across the board, and the whole channel is pressure. So here's the, 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 the elephant in the room. Is this going to lead to price increases? If you have so much demand, which exceeds supply, is the response going to be? I think yes, and I, but I think it takes time, right? Because if, if a watch is something for twice the amount that selling it for immediately in the secondary market. You're not going to adjust your price as a manufacturer to that market price right away because you're worried about a pull. So every year you'll branch it in up, but then supply will and then the clearing price in the market's not going to catch up to the secondary market, at least very quickly. I think the challenge is who it, it is happening, but who is going to be benefiting from it. If the brand is increasing the prices too fast, and we have had one example in the past where it's just doubling the price overnight, that's not going to be working. Um, but at the same time, the brand cannot be interested in having someone else make that profit. I mean, it, it, it must be as frustrating for Rolex and everyone else seeing what's going on. There's also that Enzo Ferrari production model, right? How many cars are you going to get into? We'll, make, we'll figure out what the market is, we'll make one last that the market needs. Right? So, you know, we figured the market was 400, we're going to make 399 of those. And quite a few brands have now learned from the scarcity of production model. We're going to make fewer than the market needs. Don't forget, there's also a canary in the room, and the canary is the secondary market. So, so brands can look at what the watches are doing in the secondary market, and then you can say, well, Maybe we're getting weaker there, and I think now they, they're taking the stuff seriously and they can gauge basically how the demand will be for the future product. I and mean, smart brands should do that, obviously. It, is this, uh, speaking of secondary market, the period paradise for the flippers, or are we seeing a lot of that going on? And are the brands responding to it? Everyone who is trying to sell watch has realized quickly how difficult it is. Suddenly you're dealing with people via email that you don't want to deal with. And suddenly someone wants to meet with you on a highway and you don't want to do that. So, yes it is. But going from the virtual hype where... And I had a discussion with a friend who is not into watch. He said, hey, I have this watch and I've heard I can sell it for three times the price. How do I do that? And I said, listen, this is 
hypothetical. You first need to find someone that you trust and that is actually willing to do that. So, yes it is, but also we're still having some issues in, in making that happen. So that's where the certified pre owner has a much more comfortable position than what we've seen before. So, yeah, you spoke about a flipper, which means that some individual would want to watch and try to sell it, which is what you're referring to, but uh, having been a watch collector and being involved in the secondary market for almost 20 years now, it's a totally different business. In the old days, it was the grey market, it was the underground, it was the unspoken about market, it was the discount market, it was the bad guys. And now the secondary market really is the market. If you want any one of these watches that you're referring to, almost have to go to the secondary market. If you want one of these, if you want one of the 1,300 people who want one of those 200 watches, eventually it's going to end up in a secondary market and be priced, and that will determine what, what the watch value is. So, and the brands are supporting the secondary market for much more than the user. It's now become a very well-respected, accepted marketplace for the watch business. And do and, and you see that continuing and, and becoming increasingly important? 100%. I mean, if you read the report last year, the 20, uh, 20s report from uh, Mr. Rupert from uh, Richmond, he spoke more about watch finder than he spoke about any of these individual brands in his annual report. And they bought watch finder in the United Kingdom for 200 and something million pounds, and they're a multi billion dollar corporation, but he was very focused on that segment. Give me a bit of historical perspective because it wasn't always thus with the brands paying attention to the secondary market, much less loving the secondary market. But when it started with auctions, I mean, mostly brands were, brands are kind of Swiss, Swiss in general are people that, I mean, take it this way, they just decided to do gay marriage this year. A woman went out to vote in uh, Appenzell early in 1990. Yes, the very news. So, Swiss are kind of slow and they're not exactly, you know, um, sorry. Um, <laughs> they're, they're not exactly, you know, very reactive to what, uh, how things happen. Uh, so what happened is, about, I would say, maybe 10 years ago, the uh, auction market, especially with people like Orel Bags, but also Chrissy Sotheby's, starting selling those, you know, watches that were maybe 10, 20 years old, and brands realized that the watches were doing horribly in the secondary market. And not only this, as the auction market was you know, growing, especially on the internet, the results were being shown, and brands realized that this was very detrimental to their, to their product. So gradually, you had the brands getting involved, bringing, uh, bringing uh, collectors. Patek were the first, obviously, 30 years ago, and look at the results today. But now other brands, independents do this. John has collectors that he bring and he show them the watches and they buy at auction and he tell them to buy them at auction. They support the auction in the second way market. And I think that's what really changed. Uh, I, even, I remember when Stephen, uh, maybe 10 years ago, had Max Booster say, you are now, uh, we can do certified pre I mean, this is a kind of thing that Max Booster was doing 10 years ago before Grant. It's only the last two or three years that this thing has started. And that's how important. Support your secondary market. Don't even know it. Don't think that once the watch is out of your factory, it's done, it's finished, you have to move on. You know, follow your kids and they will, they will bring you more results. And I think that's a good thing because you now the brands have realized that the 200 years of history they had before today's sale still matter and they continue to matter. So they start really to have to collect their money. I think that's a good thing. I think that now the brands are going straight to the collector as well. Partially because of it's been 20 years ago in Red Norman, Oslo, and Geneva, there was a great disdain for the times of Jonas and Curious people, and the collector in general, because the whole system was made for the press and for the distributors. Now, the brands, uh, the application launches, uh, certain brands, you, know, you can't get a watch unless you walk in and you buy it, and they're certainly the traditional daily market, but they want to know themselves who the customers are, and, and that's changed. Jeff, if I may before. So I think that uh, from, for me, one of the first questions you asked this uh, panel was about watches being an investment. And um, when you look at the watch segment as a segment of the luxury business, people, I think the, connect, 
factors and the buyers have always expected the watch to either retain value or be somewhat of an investment. Whereas if you spend the same money on a motor car, you expect it to be worth 50%, you done 20% immediately when you drive off the lot. And that was the expectation. If you buy a luxury piece of clothing, you expect it to be worth nothing when you're done. You can buy a $5,000 jacket and a $5,000 watch, but the gentleman wants his watch to retain or not going back. So I think in the old days when the watch was really worth 50 cents on the retail dollar when it was used, the brands were embarrassed about that because the customer expected something different and that's why they never supported and participated in the secondary market. Now, the secondary market is really even higher than the new watches in many cases. The brands are all supporting it, so I think that this will continue. And that's good for the brand. I want to probe the meaning of the word supportive. What dimensions does that have in the uh, The servicing the watch, offering them on their website as a certified pre-owned watch. You know, the, the, the concept of certified pre-owned, as, as William said a few minutes ago, I worked with Max probably more than 10 years ago, and he, had, he allowed me to offer the first certified pre-owned every And that was unheard of. That's been going on in the, in the car business since we can remember. So, I think that they should support with uh, certifying, uh, making sure that they're authentic, uh, offering uh, knowledge to the customers about how many pieces were made, how many pieces of particular style were made, and I think you're probing into whether a brand should be propping up auction prices to support their brand, but whatever it takes, I guess. To them. One question that has been running through some of the things you've said has to do with the effect of internet sales on in all of this. Are you seeing positive signs on, on what that's doing to the, to the marketplace and what it's doing for the brands? Because there was a time when the brands resisted as if it were death anything to do with the internet. I've been at meetings where they have said basically that you, you, you won't have the luxury experience you have to have to go into our boutique to be able to buy a watch. How has the internet sales thing changed and helped to hurt the market? I think it certainly helped the market in the, in the secondary market, for sure. And Chrono 24 is kind of in this global center where you can check out, maybe not the market clearing price, but the, the market asking price for the watch. And a couple of years ago, I remember being at a Phillips auction where Someone for the very first time had bid on a watch at the seven figures and had won it. Someone in China bought it at $24.99 for 3 million uh, francs. And they were just completely happy with that development. That was pre COVID. And certainly, in the majority of sales now, I think if you watch an auction online, they're happening for people on their, on their sofas uh, bidding seven figures. They, What's being sold on the internet is as old as the internet. I mean, when alt horology existed, people were already flipping watches, and that was, you know, prior to time zone and all that stuff. So buying watches on the internet has been going on for a very long time, but the brand were basically not looking into it and were not interested. I think now that there's some kind of order coming in, especially with you know, companies like Kuno24, um, in, the U in Germany, in the US, and other companies that watch, watch bugs, um, you, you, you sense that the brand realize that this is a problem and it's not going to go away for them, in a way, in a very Swiss way, that's the way they see things. So they, they realize that they have to do something about it, and uh, since they cannot control it, they, they're going to try to embrace it. And it's going to be awkward and it's going to be weird for everybody. But I think in the long term, they, they're going to find a solution to support it. Well, and e-commerce did help the industry tremendously during the pandemic, so we did see an acceleration. I think what's going to be interesting is to, and I'm waiting for that for the last two decades, how is the existence of e-commerce pressuring retail into overthinking their added value to the whole thing? So how does the e-commerce experience and the offline retail experience, where do they part? Where is each channel's added value? Look at it. I mean, at the end, I think it's only three years that Rolex is putting their retail prices on their website. 
I think I think it's the same. And it's still a lot of brands who put their retail price. Um, we're far away from having the two major luxury brands, Patek Rolex, selling watches on YouTube. And, and as long as those guys don't do it, I don't think, you know, I think a lot of people will not uh, jump to. It's, it's, that's the biggest issue. Is when are you going to sell your watch on YouTube? And that would make it easier to, uh, to deal with the, with the wedding next year. I think that one of the key questions here, or the key comment, is what is a luxury experience? Because for many brands, small independent specifically, the watches never are on display in the store. So what luxury experience do you have if you have a relationship with a retailer that you can never really try on a watch and compare one with the other? Well, it, it seems to me, just as a, as a reaction, it seems that Experience in history has informed the brands on what actually works when you have seen online auctions and people bidding online for auctions, when you see the various forms of people advertising watches and watches trading in that way without going into the boutique. At some point, it validates the whole idea of buying a lot. Exactly. It just goes to Switzerland about two decades to figure that out. But again, that, that whole phenomenon was uh, expanded this last year of the pandemic because you could not go into a retail store for an experience. So you had to find an online opportunity. And now today, uh, you know, is it a better experience to walk into a retail store and be greeted by a salesperson behind the counter or to go into the fourth floor or fifth floor or eighth floor of a, of a lounge environment and meet with people sitting and having a drink together? What is that actual experience? And where would you actually find the comparison of pieces that you're looking at? Well, one, one question about it. does it depend a little bit on how effective it will be on what the watch is? It, it's one thing if it, I would say a Rolex is a commodity product, you know, some areas and some areas and some areas. But when you get to more complicated pieces and I would say more innovative pieces, does that have an effect? Or for that matter, higher prices. It's one thing to buy a ten thousand dollar commodity price watch for twenty thousand. It's another thing if it's three hundred thousand. I do think there's a there are a lot of upsides and good things about the way the market's developed. One of the downsides is that watches really need to be tried on and, and felt. And there are a lot of watches that look really great in pictures and then you have them on the watch uh, on the wrist, but they aren't, or, or vice versa. We were talking about the first time I talked with you was 20 years ago because I was right after a lightning trip. The 1815 moon phase had come out. I didn't look at the good pictures, but on a trip to, to Langy, three people had that watch on. It looked amazing. No one really wanted it. Um, we, we talked about it. And, um, you know, it's missing today because um, a watch of the best part. You mentioned it to me, and I said, I know where there is one. Yeah. Yeah. And I was here. Yeah. Um, but you know, when there's when there's only 11 watches made, or something, or 200, or whatever the thing is, and it's just pressure to buy them, you don't have the chance to go try on the watch or, or experience it the way that you used to before. And that's a yeah, there, there, There's one thing going on, and I want to get to your reaction. Over this period of the virus, we have seen great sales. But it also seems we aren't seeing very many complicated watches being introduced. We have members of the GPHG Academy sitting here around the table, and we all have to hold their nose and vote on things. So is that something that we're going to see reignited now? We're going to see more innovation, or is the industry decided? that they can just get by with dial colors now because demand is so strong. Well, there's two issues. One is the supply issue, where it's difficult to get parts to get more complicated watches. It's complicated to get watchmakers to make more complicated watches. There's also the uh, domain issue where, you know, it's kind of Instagram driven today and uh, a green Nautilus might be more photogenic than, uh, you know, a Tobio from Patek that you can only see from the back. Uh, I, I think that that kind of thing is, is important to, uh, to brands, and it's cyclical. I mean, right now the fashion is 
you know, green watches that are very Instagram-ish. Maybe in two or three years, Instagram will be done, and there will be another trend, maybe that will be complicated. Um, I think I, I've been collecting for 30 years, so trends come and go. And right now, we're, I agree with you, we're in a three-hand trend, but I think complication will come back to be your main reviewers, multi-complications. I think it's a, it's a matter of educating people. Right now, we also have a new audience, so it's buying into watches that they might be overwhelmed by the thought of turning on some mini reviews, etc. etc. So it is up to us, the industry, to educate this new clientele to, hey, it's not just about making money, it's still about passion. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges that we're having. Stephen, how, how are you seeing it? Are you seeing a relaxation in demand for the complicated pieces and everything is focusing on the simpler, more fashionable things? Um, I think so. I'm a part of the film, so we launched the watch two or three years ago before the craze of the Starry Berries, which I felt in 25 years of watch collecting, for me it was one of the most beautiful watches produced in 10 years that I'd seen at a price point of 60,000 retail approximately. But the problem is when you look at it from the production side from the company, you can't, even if the demand is, the company can only make 150 watches a year, so I make 200 watches a year this year, so next year we're going to push it up to 230. So if there's demand for 200 watches, but that's on a lower price point, you cannot support the business by producing 200 of that model. You have to have a mix of more complicated watches that sell at a higher price point, especially for the small independent brands, otherwise you're not going to have a viable business. So from that perspective, we haven't had a problem. Whatever we produce it right now is selling, whether it, this morning we launched a $520,000 Dreamwatch Turbionic that all sold out. So, there's a price What's that? Congratulations. Okay. Thank you. No problem with the complicated stuff, and I'm not seeing, from my clientele, the train towards more simple watches. I'm sure it's happening, but I don't see it. It's, it's very niche. I mean, um, the between is very niche. I'm sorry, but anyway, it's, you know, you go in the street, you take some guy, and you've never heard of the Bijou. I think if you look at uh, the big guys, the Richemont, the, the Swatch, the Rolex, and the Patek, yes, I think there's a tendency to go to uh, the simpler three hand. And I agree absolutely with, um, with Stephen that in order for the business to grow, you need to have very high end watches. Uh, but uh, Patek, the issue for me of the, uh, of the Nautilus is the fact that Patek doesn't have a lot of entry level watches. There's not a lot. I mean, you, you're starting collecting or you want to buy your first Patek. There's not a lot of choice. It's a Nautilus, it's an Aquanaut, and now the new kind of travel. But, you, but if you want to meet, you know, meet complication, then you have a lot of choice. You have the uh, annual calendar, you have the world time, you have chronographs. There's a lot of choice if you want to go go 50. But 20, 30, there's not a lot. And others. Yeah, but I, I thought they addressed that this year when they came out with the brand new revitalized simple freehand color drop. Kind of late, yes. I, I thought they did address that actually. I think the other thing, I mean, you think back to what did collectors care about a couple decades ago versus now. Certain complications, um, one thing. I think finishing is another uh, category where I think it was super important to collectors in the past. And now it's a very important in certain niches. Um, and the, the Kari Buda line is working really well, and before the secondary prices, it's a little forcing. But if you look at the broad based watches that are out there, it's not really that important. If you look at the new movements that are in the new calendar, it's in the new perpetual um, calendar of the day, these are not as interesting movements as uh, they used to from the finishing point of Actually, you touched on something which I'd like to explore a little bit because you mentioned what's going on with the, the, the indies and all of the exquisite finishing that they're doing. Big article in the New York Times yesterday about happy times are here again for the, the indies. The Grunefelds are sold out for the next X years. Kari Gutelainen can't produce any more watches and what he has. It just went down the list of indies. Is that something that we see continuing now? Definitely. Because the more mainstream 
the state of the steel trend in the three end when it comes to more people will look into something that's exciting and different and add something that the big brands cannot add. And even if it's just a personal relationship between me, the consumer, and the watchmaker behind, that is something that is irreplaceable. And that brings us back to what makes this product so irresistible. It's the emotion behind it. And right now we're seeing a disconnect between the investment of the product. It's not the emotional part that we used to have. And the independence bring that back. It's the passion about watching. I, I, I agree. I think that the, um, the Indies produce so few watches, whether it's 50 watches or 200 watches, or even in John's case, six or seven or 800 watches, that the marketplace in the last 18 months has expanded so much that the demand will now will be greater than the supply for the foreseeable future. What worries me is, and I don't know all the statistics, but you take a company like Langa that did really well, secondary market over the time of COVID, they cut back production from 5,000 pieces to 3,000 pieces, they cut back retailers, but they're part of a public company. They can ramp up to 5,000 again, probably in a couple months. The independent brands cannot ramp up as quickly as that. So when, they, when the company decides Langa must now produce 5,000 watches again, if the marketplace changes, then I think that they could see an impact. But I do believe that the independent brands, 50 to 5, 6, 7 hundred watches a year, there's more, the demand is going to be greater than supply. So, I have one, one other question, which now we talked about complicated, I want to go back to simple. Sport watches have been very, very in and central to a lot of the demand that we have been seeing last two years. Is that going to change when people start going back to the office? Are we going to go back to dress watches again? What's no. an office? <laughs> no. Uh, sorry. I don't, don't mean to interrupt. I, th I heard a term from my good friend Danny Gogger many years ago prior to COVID and he said that the first style is beach to tux. And beach to tux, that's what makes a Nautilus so appealing because you can wear it to the beach and you can wear it at night all the time. And this started many years ago here in the US with Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger wearing these big APs with tuxedos. So I think sports watches, it's a, it's a lifestyle. Uh, will people even wear suits again? I don't, we, we don't know. But I think that the, the, the beach to tux is going to stay and moving back to the office is not going to impact. So, so Paddock made a monster mistake when they came out with the uh, new Calatrava to replace the 3919. No, they did not make a mistake. They had to do that watch. Uh, that watch is important actually for them. I think uh, I think that they have been the 5196. I'm going to talk reference. So it's the earlier Calatrava, the reference 5196, uh, which was in the catalog for nearly 20 years. It was so old. The movement was tiny, manual wine. That, that they have to renew the, the, the collection. I think has been in business 20, 20, 20 years, 20, 10 years. Uh, those guys have to, uh, those guys are looking long term. They, we're saying the office is dead, uh, the uh, uh, leather watches are gone. I don't think that's true. I think we go back to the leather watch. I think uh, people will go back to our offices. Um, brands like Patek, brands like Rolex uh, are not driven by fake fashion and you know the latest trend. They, they have they have a ten year plan. They they look at things very long term. So I don't think you can look at something and say, oh my god, what a mistake they made a green back. Maybe they're late on the green back, but maybe they're early on the green back. They they know what they're doing. This is not something that uh, we can criticize those brands for. So what, one last area I'd like to touch on, which is limited editions we have seen over the last couple of years, an increase in the numbers of limited editions and some brands that have not really played in that game that much stepping into that area. Do you see that increasing or is that again just another transient phenomenon that will ease itself? Unfortunately, yes, I think we will see an increase in limited edition. But I do understand why. It, it, it is more about storytelling because you can always add something to a limited edition and makes it more exciting. It also appeals to people that want to have a return on investment, which is 
security and environment is very expensive. But I also urge the industry to make sure that we still have spare parts for those limited editions from 20 years from now. And 20 years ago, when that started, we already immediately saw some of the brands were not capable of providing proprietary bracelets for the box that were produced 10 years ago. So if that's happening, then we're going to see much more frustration than we ever had. I think you also have, as limited editions become more popular, you then make multiple limited editions. Uh, so it's a great thing that comes out with the super ocean that's very colorful, rainbow dot. And the thing says, we're just going to do so many. And then it turns out to be more likely popular. So, okay, we'll do another limited edition of rainbow dot. So I think that's the trend we'll keep on seeing, which kind of waters down one of the bigger edition that is. Does that fall into fool me once, fool me twice at some point? Yes, I mean, we were talking about Kari uh, before, and, and you know, I'm going to do 10 of these in, in titanium, and that's it. Well, okay, I'll do 10 in platinum, too. I'll do 10, and good for him, right, to have that, that commercial success. But it does kind of change what the limited edition is because it's not so tight to find it. So I think we have just a couple of minutes left if we have some questions from members of the audience. Okay, great. Yes, thank you. I, I, I better hand you a microphone because it's very loud. You go soon. You know, we talk a lot about the buying online or buying in stores. And buying online or buying in stores and seeing launches is nice. But now there's this big trend toward having this exhibition launches at the store that are not really available for sale. It's such a little frustrating. I don't know whether everybody feels about like that. You mean like, like John, with uh, you go in and you look at watches, that are not real watches, and Rolex. And Rolex. I think it's, it's basically, they have the space, right? So they have to fill the space with something. But tech has been doing it for years. You go to the boutique in Geneva, you, you won't be able to buy anything, and this has been going on at least since 2010. Um, they have the space, they want to do a sale. I think they, they have to do something there, rather than, uh, it's, it's part of the frustration of the waiting list. But at least you have something you can try. But it's all, I mean, it's like buying a car. You also go into a garage and there is the car that you eventually might be buying, but it, this is not usually the car that you end up buying. So I think that's okay, and that's also like, that's probably the only solution that there is to have a store market as a product, because it really is depressing to look at these empty shelves right now. I get that. But there, there has to be an effect on the constraint of supply that exists right now, which has You could remember lots of times when you could walk into a boutique and just walk out with your watch. I think the, the other thing that's quite frustrating is if you're not a customer of some of these brands already, you can't become a customer. Because they, they look at you and they say, we don't own any of these things, so we're not going to sell you anything. Uh, if, de if demand is so... A couple of questions. I guess number one, if demand is so high, why not raise the price? And as far as the retail experience, I mean, I guess it's one issue if they don't have the watches in stock. But in my experience, a lot of times you go to a retail store, the sales folks might not know that much about the watch anyway. You go there and they say, well, here it is. Do you like it? Do you want to buy it? So I just see a few issues there as far as inventory, pricing, and also the retail experience itself. I think that there's been consolidation in luxury goods in general, and these big groups have developed rich home care and pick your category. I think they've paid more attention to the long-term brand value of, of something. And, and I think that influences all the way to independence where, you know, Jean or before maybe that model previously, they would have worried about, let me sell watches, make a good living, and then I'm out. Whereas nowadays, it's about what happens after I'm gone, who's going to make these things, is this going to live on? And that desire to have long-term brand value, um, you know, it means that you price underneath what the market price is, and you have this scarcity um, value kind of built in. You know, I had a, a Richard Mule ad come up on my Instagram the other day, and I thought, why are they bothering, right? Why, why do they even have a marketing budget? 
but they're clearly concerned about um, long-term brand value. Um, thank you. This has been a super interesting discussion to listen to. Uh, my question is going to be, uh, in 2019, there must have been some sense of where the market would be going. Um, and here we are in 2021, two years later. So before the pandemic hit, and where we are now with the pandemic and the market continuing to rise, how much of a gap do you see between what you expected to see in 2021, back in 2019, and where we actually are? That's actually a great question. I wish I had thought of that one. I think, I think you have. But I think um, looking at that is the industry did expect 2021 to be very different to what we are today. What came on top of that is not only more demand, and also goes back to your question, the watch brands have lost several weeks or month in production time. So we not only see more demand, which came a bit more unexpected than we probably have planned, but we also have that huge bump in production that currently is one of the big issues. Because you cannot just scale up production. You still need to build a manufacturer, you need to hire people, you need to invest, and that's, that's something that could not happen overnight. That's something that needs a lot of 10 years. And now, suddenly, you need to work. There is certain usually talks in 50 years of strategy and planning in 10 years. And that is why well. you cannot just now blow up production, except for the long years. In terms of trend on products, um, I think in 2019, 2018, 2019, we're seeing more vintage re-edition, kind of a nostalgia. But I think that's kind of like a winning way now. I think faster than we thought, maybe. Uh, it's back to uh, stainless steel integrated waste watches, paradise uh, with Rolex and the uh, I think I didn't see that coming to be honest with you, too, as well. Um, and I think also the lack of, uh, you have less like, about lack of complication. I think we really have more complication. But, um, it may change again, you know, it may change again in two years. I don't know if COVID or, I think it's just a question of trend here. I don't know if COVID was really a factor, to be honest. I, I, I would second that, I think. We are now actually very close to probably what they were imagining in the beginning of 2020. We are nowhere near what they were imagining in April and May there was a state of panic in Switzerland. I was on lots and lots of calls. They thought the world would come to an end. So surprisingly, the patient not only survived, but is doing better than they could have ever imagined. I think one thing that certainly um, surprised me about the last couple of years is how broad-based the hobby has become. A friend of mine, Michael, uh, Michael Freeberg, um, said a number of years ago there are probably only 300 collectors in the U.S. And I don't know if that number is right or wrong, but if you look at these land, these iconic models like the 2499, the 3448, you know, they only made three, four, five hundred of these pieces over sometimes a 40 year period. There clearly weren't that many collectors. I don't know how many collectors there are now, but you know, 7 billion people on the planet. Got a long ways to go, so I would think we'll continue to, to get more people interested in this hobby. Okay, well, I want to thank all the members of the panel and thank all the